if we start in the AFC East, I gave consideration to a couple. I mean, you know, Kincaid joining Knox is interesting, you know, pairing there, the tight end room in Buffalo. You think about Miami and their running back room just with the sheer speed they have with Mostert, Jeff Wilson, and now A-Chain jumping in the mix. Like, that's an intriguing one. I ended up going with the Jets with their edge rushers just because, Mm -hmm. and you touched on this in your piece, uh, but when you have Will McDonald, John Franklin Myers, Jermaine Johnson, you've got Bryce Huff, you've got Carl Lawson, you've got Clemens who did some good things. Like that's that's six edge rushers that they've got. That's an an alpha, uh, uh, a Bravo, and a, what do they call the uh, a Charlie? I guess Cobra. is what the Cobra. Is what the, yeah, I mean they've got three three full groups they can roll through there now. You know, DJ, like, so it's always funny, right? Because we always get asked to grade drafts and do all this other stuff, and it's not until one, you come out of it and you begin to listen to the pressers where you hear the coaches in the gym express the plan. Here's what the plan is for McDonald. And so to hear Joe D and hear Robert Sala talk about why Will McDonald was the pick and how they were saying, oh, man, we felt like he was the best pass rusher in the draft in terms of his explosiveness and what he brought to the table and how we will bring him into the rotation. Like, yeah, he needs to be better at first and second down. But this was about waves waves of rushers this also to me when it comes to the jets we talk about team building well when you get aaron Rodgers and you're looking at it from an optimistic standpoint you're thinking well we're gonna score a ton of points we're gonna score points and we're gonna make people chase points so yeah people they can say they're gonna run the ball at you but you can't run at us when you're down 14 points so what we're going to do is now we're gonna load up on pass rushes like the eagles were able to do and we're going to hunt this obvious passing downs and so i love it from that standpoint if the offense clicks like it could click with aaron Rodgers and the young wide receivers that they have well now we'll look back and they'll say man the jets were genius to take another pass rusher who has the ability to just heat them up because remember they don't want to blitz they want to rush with four and so to rush you with four man you got to have a lot of bodies that are coming every other down to continue to keep that that pass rush pace at a high level. So it could work. And But you're right. They are loaded. They're loaded outside at the edge rusher spots. And one of the things you saw with him, which we saw with the Georgia guys, uh, we've seen it with the Georgia guys the last couple of years, but scheme wise, I mean, you could, you would know this better than I would, but it's curious to me, like how many of these college schemes and they play with like a four eye or you've got a undersized edge rusher, but he's playing on the inside shoulder of the tackle. Like, and I think Sal even said it like, hey, when he made the draft call, he's like, hey, man, we'll yeah. get you out of that four. Yeah, eye. We're going to loosen right. you up, get you out in that wide nine and cut you loose. So that to me, like we talked about with Trayvon Walker was the same thing. All those tight alignments like that. When they let him get out there, you saw some good stuff. He just didn't get a chance to do it all that much. Yeah. So just so, so everyone understands the reason why they're putting guys in four eyes, uh, like Iowa State was a really like a three, three, three team, like a three, three, five yeah. team. They played like a three safety look and they would put their defensive ends on the inside eyes of the offensive tackles and the reason why is because they want the ball to bounce to the sideline and then they'll chase it down with their speed and so you have a guy like will mcdonald which is great in that that he's pinching inside he's diving down inside you're making it run the hump and you're saying we got all these little guys on the field to chase it down where in the pro game man you line up in that they're gonna run it down i mean they're gonna absolutely obliterate you (laughs) like yeah down there and so it's the requires, outside zone every step. Yeah. And, and, oh, and man. They, so, so it's going to require McDonald to make a position change and put him in a wide nine. But you see athletically at 238 pounds, this guy's first step quickness, his burst, his motor, he is going to be a problem for those tackles on those obvious passing downs where they're trying to kick set and get vertical. You're not going to have a chance. And when you have him and Jermaine Johnson and Carl Lawson and all these other guys just coming at you down after down after down, Man, it's it's look at the relentlessness from the pass rush unit. This is gonna wear you out. Yeah, I think about him and Huff as two guys that can work as closers. That twenty snaps, just give them twenty snaps. They have elite, elite get off. Huff is always up there in like the top five in terms mm-hmm. of get off. When we look at those numbers every year. And one of the things to think about, you get in that wide nine and you get elite get off. You know what that does? That expands everything for Quentin Williams. And now all of a sudden, Quentin Williams, there's no neighbors in there anymore. Man, he's got oh, lots no, of room to operate. Because that tackle knows I gotta get gone. Get out. If I don't yeah. get if I don't if I don't get out, it's a problem. And so now you are right. You're creating one on one for Quentin Williams to be able to operate two way goals on a a helpless guard. Because we've said this, most teams 
have an inferior player playing inside. And if they're mm-hmm. able to give Quentin Williams the freedom to operate on the fish, good luck. Long yep. day. Long day no for doubt. the quarterback because he's going to take a no lot doubt. of shots. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting one. Um, all right, let's get to Cincinnati here. I want to get to them in the in the north. They were the team I came up with. And just looking at the wideouts, when you have Jamar Chase, you have Higgins, you've got Boyd, and they added two guys in this draft with Charlie Jones, who we talked a lot about with his speed, and then Yosivash, the the wideout from from Princeton, who can really run. He's a track background, mm-hmm. uh, big time athlete. But I thought, and I, you might even have mentioned this on the previous episode, but I, you know Higgins is going to get paid. They're not going to let Higgins go. They've got Jamar no. Chase. They're going to pay Chase. The odd man out's probably going to be Boyd, who's a good football yep. player. But they need one of those two guys to step into the mix. But now I think, man, that's that's two young guys to add to a really talented uh, trio they already have. Uh, two young guys that can can step in and play. And Charlie Jones is a guy that I'm fascinated by. You watch him play mm-hmm. at Purdue, man. He has – look, he's even different than what they have because Tyler Boyd is a true chain mover, possession guy. Charlie Jones has juice. His beep, yep. beep, his right now, he has speed and quickness and – I can just see where you could clear the zone with him and have T. Higgins or Jamar Chase running up underneath. And even though Higgins has the vertical threat on the outside, it's different when you have a slot guy that can kind of take the top off the defense. Uh, Jones's speed and stuff is spectacular. And I will give the Cincinnati Bengals credit. I think they do a really good job of drafting and drafting with an eye towards the future. They're one year ahead of those things. Think about last year when they take Dax Hill. And then they lose both yeah. of their safeties, Jesse Bates and Von Bell. Well, who slides in? Like, they do a really good job of identifying, here's where we could be weak next year. Let's go ahead and get a player in now so we can groom him for when he has to take a, a bigger role in year two. So that it, to me, it's a smart team building. It's what you should do. And they do Tobin and that, that, that staff has done a really good job of putting it together. Yeah, no, it, I, I'm with you. I think it's it's really a – a look towards the future there. Uh, let's keep it going through the AFC. Tennessee in their running back room. You've already got Henry. You've got Haskins, who's a physical runner. Like th- Those guys pair off each other you know, quite well. And then Tajay Spears, throw him into the mix to that running back group. I think he's an unbelievable player. We talked about it. I didn't mention it by name. We don't ever want to you know, see anybody drop in the draft. But there was a lot of talk and talking to teams that he could slip a little bit because of a knee. Um, and then, you know, he still went in a pretty good spot. I think we'd gone a little bit higher if he had been clean medically through the whole process. But you cannot debate the fact of his skill set and what he brings to the table. So when you add Tajay Spears to a running back group that that already has, you know, maybe the – well, I mean, he has been the most productive runner in the league in Derrick Henry over several years now and Hassan Haskins. I think that's an interesting position group they've amassed there. Oh, it's a very interesting position. I think it's one that you want to continue to work on. Uh, you want to continue to build that stuff up. And so to me, it's super smart for them to take that approach. It's super smart for them to do exactly what they've done. And why wouldn't you want to do it? I just, man, I just love how like certain teams know their identity. They know who they are. And so when I think about the depth that you have in a big back, then another back that can come in and play physically. And then Tajay Spears, who to me is an every down back. You know, I know Mm -hmm. people worry about the, the, the concern, but when you watch him play to me, he's a three down back and he has a little juice that those other guys don't. Uh, it's going to be a problem when the Tennessee Titans commit to running the ball like like they can and like they have. It's going to be a challenge dealing with that. No doubt. Um, all right, let's get to the West. There was actually three teams I was going to mention, and then we'll circle in. We'll settle in on one. But the, the receiving cores of Denver and the Chargers. So Denver with Sutton, Patrick, Judy, Callaway, who has experience in this offense in, in New Orleans. KJ Hamler, and then then they bring in Mims, who is a player that we both liked mm-hmm. coming out of Oklahoma. Is a good player. Hamler's going to end up getting traded. I, I would, I bet you mm-hmm. money that he's. You know, mm-hmm. I, I'm guessing he'll probably be gone here by the time we get to the regular season. He'll be the odd man out. But that's a loaded position group. Then the Chargers, they add Johnston from TCU to a group that includes Mike Williams, Keenan Allen, Josh Palmer, and Jalen Guyton. So those are two teams with stacked receiver rooms. But the one I'm going to settle on here that I'm curious about because of the youth, when you have the Kansas City Chiefs who already had Joshua Williams, mm-hmm. Jalen Watson, Sneed, McDuffie, they they draft Jamari Connor who can play in that nickel. He's literally going to back up McDuffie as a nickel. Like all these guys are first couple year players, Buck. Like I don't know if there's a better young position group in the NFL than what Brett Beach has been able to amass in their secondary over a two year period of time. 
Yeah, DJ, I don't know. And he, here's the thing. I don't know if you saw some of the stuff that came out where Barrett Beach sees Kadarius Tony as a number one receiver. And for them to pick him up for a third rounder, uh, for yeah. them to say, you know, here's the thing. And, and I like the transparency. He was like, uh, just because we haven't seen him play and do the vertical stuff and do that, maybe he hasn't played with a quarterback that's like our quarterback that will allow him to expand his game. And so mm-hmm. we've seen him do the, the gadget stuff, the catch and run stuff, the jet sweeps, the reverses and all that. Maybe there's more uh, meat on the bone when it comes to how he can play. And so in our offense with our quarterback, we're going to give him every opportunity. And I wouldn't bet against him because considering what they were able to do with Tyreek Hill, and Tyreek Hill is a, is a freakish talent. But remember, they took him in the fifth round. And I don't think any about it. Uh, we can talk about the character stuff or whatever. I don't know if anyone, when he was getting drafted, thought that he would be a number one wide receiver. And so mm-hmm. give the Chiefs credit for, for their development and their ability to have an imagination for what he can do. Maybe Kadarius Tony plays that number one and all these other guys fill into these roles that, I mean, let's be honest, they have a ton of playmakers on this thing. How do they put it together? But it's a very deep and talented group. Now it's just a matter of what roles and responsibilities do you give every player so they can be at their best when it comes to their talent. That's one of the things that's a great uh, assignment for us. We can do it on a, on a podcast going forward would be to kind of rank some of these position groups by division. Like if you just looked at the pass catchers in the AFC West, like how would you <laughs> those one to four that's we'll say, we'll put a pin in that. Cause that's got, we'll, we'll do that in a future mm-hmm. podcast. But that's a fun conversation. Uh, let's get over to the NFC. Uh, a couple in the, uh, in the East, I thought were fascinating. Uh, when you look at the Dallas linebacker group, I thought that was kind of underrated when you have LVE, uh, Damone Clark, Jabril Cox, uh, and then Overshone goes into the mix. All big, long kind of body types. Interesting how they kind of have collected a bunch of these different guys. They can all run. Uh, they're all big. They're all long. I thought that was an interesting group. Uh, I ended up going with Philly, though, in their defensive tackles, not the edge rushers. We talk a lot about the edge rushers, and they've got a good group there. Uh, add Nolan Smith into that mix. But when you've got DTs, it's hard to find talented DTs. And when you've got Fletcher Cox, Jordan Davis, Milton Williams, who if you look, go look up his workout <laughs> number is coming out. He's a very talented player. Now you drop Jalen Carter into that mix. I don't know there's a better rotation of defensive tackles in the league. No, I mean, let's be honest. They added the best defensive prospect in the draft in Jalen yep. Carter. We can talk about the concerns about the character on and off the field, but when you turn on the tape and you watch him play, there are not many guys on earth that can walk uh, around and do the stuff that he does on the football field. So now you put him alongside Fletcher Cox. You talked about Milton Williams. You've seen some of the other guys that are in that rotation. Uh, It's a problem to deal with them. And one of the reasons why the Eagles were so successful defensively last year is what Javon Hargraves gave them on the inside. Well, now we're talking about a better prospect than Javon Mm -hmm. Hargraves. He's not a better player yet, but he's a better prospect than Javon Hargraves was coming out. And so you put these guys together, it can be a nightmare and a handful. And we said the best way to – to, to pressure quarterbacks is right up the gut because they feel mm-hmm. that pressure immediately. They now have the ability to not only stop the run on early downs, but they can create chaos in the pocket because they have dominant guys on the interior. No doubt. Um, it's a, it is a loaded group. Uh, we get to the North. I ended up going with the Packers wide receiver group for, for this reason. It's the exact same thing I just said about Kansas city and their DBs. Now you look at Green Bay. This is a two-year group. Like these are all first and second year players now. When you look at Watson, uh, Dobbs, you got uh, Jaden Reed gets drafted, Wicks gets drafted, and Dubose gets drafted. They drafted three wideouts this year after having drafted two last year. Now I put that down there because it's interesting to me just having all these young players at one position. My question to you, because you've talked about this in the past and we've had this discussion. Mm-hmm. Young quarterbacks pairing with veteran wide receivers seems to be the secret sauce. As they get established, now you can mix in the younger guys. They are going to have, and even though he's been in the league a few years, Jordan Love is a first-year starter with all first- and second-year receivers. I'm curious to see how that works. Yeah, I'm curious, and normally I would say I wouldn't like it. And the reason why I don't like it is because with a young quarterback, he needs stability and consistency. And when you have veteran receivers – Route running is consistent. And so he's going to know when I get to the top of my drop and I throw to this spot, because now you throw the spots instead of throwing the people, I'm going to let it go to the spot and my veteran receiver is going to get there. We have seen the jumps that guys have made when they've had veteran additions come. Josh Allen jumping 
a significantly when he has Stefan Diggs. Jalen Hurts taking a significant jump when A.J. Brown comes over. It's just something different. The only time we've really seen it work with young players is if there was a history. And so mm-hmm. Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, they knew each other from LSU. They, they had thrown the ball. There was a chemistry and a connectivity that was already there. Even Jalen Hurts and Devonta Smith, chemistry, connectivity. It's just harder for everybody to grow and develop at the same rate that would be the only worry and concern that I would have by the Packers receiver group. All of these guys are learning on the fly, and I don't know how that chemistry is going to be when you have a bunch of young guys. You don't have that old leader that can be the, the reliable threat while the young guys are developing as the wide receiver two or the wide receiver three in those roles. Yeah, I mean, and you look at, obviously, with Mahomes coming to the league, having Kelsey already in place, look at Herbert coming to the league, having Keenan Allen and Mike Williams like, A lot of these guys that have popped have had those sure, reliable veteran dudes, man. Trevor Lawrence, watching Trevor this year with Christian Kirk and Zay Jones and Evan Ingram, guys that have been around the block a few times. He's his game should go up another notch with Calvin Ridley coming on board. There is Mm -hmm. something about the security of having veteran receivers that you can trust and rely on because it is all about trust, that, that connection between quarterback and pass catcher. Yep, 100%. Uh, all right, the Falcons running back room. Uh, B. John Robinson joining Algier and Cordell or Patterson. I thought that was an intriguing, just with all the different skills you have there. All the different skills. And there's some people that hate this pick. They hate them taking a running back. But when you hear Arthur Smith talk about he's a home run hitter and the way that he can impact the game in so many different areas, you understand why they were so fascinated with B. John Robinson. But then let's go back and look at, Man, I think this is a team that was maybe top five in rushing last year with Tyler Algiers, Cordero Patterson playing that. Look, man, I don't know. Like, Cordero Patterson is playing like I wanted him to play when he first entered the league after we did the report at Tennessee. (laughs) He's decided now in his mid-30s, that's the player that he's going to become. And, yeah, all those guys bring a different style to the position. But, man, you can just see how Arthur Smith is going to utilize it. I mean, it's going to be a, a nightmare to defend this Falcons offense, despite uh, a young quarterback still trying to find his way, their running game, that running back room is going to be problematic for people to match up with. No doubt. Um, it, it's going to be a fun group to watch. I'm excited to see how that group kind of comes together. I think it's a good pairing when you have Arthur Smith knows what to do with these guys too. Um, so I think that'll be fun. Uh, last one, we'll get out to the West. And we could go a couple different groups with Seattle. Obviously, when you bring in JSN and you put him in the mix with Tyler Lockett and Metcalf, I think we've talked a lot about that. I came away looking at it, though, kind of more intrigued by the completeness of this running back group. When you throw in Charbonnet and and McIntosh into this mix, Charbonnet, who can be a four-minute back, Mm -hmm. McIntosh, who can really catch the ball out of the backfield, and then you mix them in with Kenneth Walker. Again, all first- and second-year players. Running back's a young man's position. They've got three good young ones. And what I love about this, I feel like Pete Carroll the last two years has been like, you know what? If I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out doing it my way. It's my way. Yeah. I'm going to do it my way. We're going to run the ball. We're going to do play action. I'm going to get back to playing good defense, but running the ball. The thing that has hurt them is since the loss of, of Marshawn Lynch, right? Marshawn Lynch was a rarity in terms of being a three down back who was not only physical and, and aggressive as a runner, but also was really good. If you go back and look at Russell Wilson's early career, Marshawn Lynch was the ultimate bailout player in terms of catching the ball out the backfield. Well, what you can't get in one Marshawn, you can't get in three different players. And so you get the size and physicality in Zach Charbonnet, who also can catch the ball out the backfield. You get the juice and explosiveness in Kenneth Walker. And you have, like, I mean, you talked about McIntosh being special out the backfield. You now have given Geno Smith the ability to continue to allow this team to play smash mouth ball while letting Geno play action, check down screens, swings, utilize the entire field. The wide receiver court is terrific. But now these these guys that he has behind him, they never have to change their style. And so the Seattle Seahawks can be more explosive, but equally as efficient while still kind of remaining that ground and pound ball control unit that Pete Carroll wants them to be. 100%. I think you're right on. And I think the other thing I would add to that is they hit the tackles last year, two starting tackles with Lucas and Cross. They drafted two interior linemen this draft with Ola with Timmy and Bradford that could end up being starters. So you could end up having four young offensive linemen. And I do like the fact of offensive line getting to be together for a long period of time. Potentially, oh, yeah. this group could be together for a long time. It can be together for a long time. And so right in front of us, 
DJ, what's crazy? They've done a makeover. They've done a rebuild on the fly while still going to the playoffs when no one thought they could go to the playoffs. And so you look back and you, you well, Pete Carroll and John Snyder are laughing because they were able to pull it off when no one thought that they would be able to move on from Russell Wilson and become a better team. This will this has the potential to be a much better team, not only in 2023, but when you look at 2024, this is when this team really could pop when these guys settle into their roles. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's really an unbelievable turnaround and uh, remaking that entire roster. John Schneider and Pete Carroll, hats off to them. And hopefully Gino can continue to play at the level he's playing at. So, you know, we'll see what that looks like going into the future.